In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. It is probably one of the most important things I look at all week. Watching your names come across the screen saying good morning and hello on Facebook and YouTube. I can't believe I'm saying that. It's true, though. Uh, something I did not expect. But I don't know the context where you're watching worship or what's going on in your mind or your heart. Um, a question I'd love to ask if you were here in person. Why do you go to church? What are you hoping to get out of it? And maybe some of you, it's a tradition that's been going on for years. Others, you're looking for some wisdom or a message that comforts the heart. Or maybe you seek some of those promises that are made on our behalf. At noon this, this morning, we are with about 10 to 15 people. We're going to gather at the font in our nave, and we are going to baptize a young child. His mom has recently moved back to Birmingham and was baptized here many years ago. And I wonder what is driving that decision to stand up there at a, with a child and make these promises. I wonder sometimes if the driving motivation is somewhat individualistic. We want something special. We want something, we want our lives to be different from what they are in the world. And so we hear that promise of eternal life. We hear that promise that God is offering something different. And we say, I want that, or I want that for my child. But whoa, listen to this gospel message. I think that Peter wants something that is very different as well. They've been following Jesus around for about two and a half years at this point. And then Jesus tells the disciples, I am about to go into Jerusalem and it's going to be a lot of suffering and it's going to lead to my death. And Peter's like, no, 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 you can't, you can't be speaking truth. That's crazy, man. Get behind me, Satan. Jesus is like, look, if you want to find a life, you've got to lose it. You've got to lose it. You have to pick up your cross and follow me. And I wonder how many people would choose to be baptized if we told them that you're going to lose your life in the midst of this. That this journey is difficult and painful. And yet, through that, we find eternal life. We find promise. And so I've been wrestling with what it is we're teaching people at church and what it is that we come together. And I, I, I get the whole faith thing. Um, but I, I've come up with something different and I, and I know that a Sunday morning from a sermon is not the time to cast some kind of greater vision for what St. Stephen's ought to be. But I keep coming back to a book that we read here um, in April uh, by the, the greatest, one of the greatest Anglican leaders, one of the greatest Buddhist, Buddhist faith leaders of the world, the uh, Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu. And they said something that has been really, I've been wrestling with since April. And they said, to change this world, we're missing one thing. We are not teaching people one thing. We're not teaching it in schools, in colleges. Maybe we're not teaching it in church to the extent that we should. 
there is only one core competency that is missing. And it's, it's, it's really simple. Compassion. If we were teaching compassion as a fundamental skill that is necessary for the thriving of people, the world would be a drastically different place. So I've been thinking about that. Because you hear it, you hear it in, you certainly hear it in the Old Testament lesson when Moses is speaking to his people and he says, look, I hear your pain. And in Paul's letter to the Romans today where Paul is saying, look, you cannot fight evil with evil. You have to fight love. Treat, the, treat your enemy. Give them shelter and food. I mean, it's a, it's a drastic statement. So the question arises, how do we teach compassion? So I want to explore compassion a little bit. I think compassion is the key to finding the fullness of life and joy, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm not, any, uh, not saying anything unique and, and probably not saying anything that you haven't thought about before. But when I look at one of the barriers for compassion— What is a barrier for compassion right now? It seems to be anger. I mean, think of all the anger that exists right now in our world. I mean, when we're not yelling at each other on Facebook, we're yelling at each other when we're gathering as people. I think that human relationships and family relationships are being broken apart by anger. But if you think about anger, anger is not a primary emotion. It is a secondary emotion. This is where it's key to kind of consider this, that anger is never anger in itself. It always comes from someplace else. It comes from hurt. It comes from fear or worry. It comes from the lack of justice. But the anger comes from someplace. There is something underneath that anger that is responsible for the anger arising. And so when we listen to, to Moses tell the people that God hears them, part of compassion, that barrier is resolved when we try to go underneath and listen to the discerning factor that's causing the anger. The other principal kind of emotion that I'm observing right now is sadness. And I think sadness is interesting because usually sadness is a recognition of a loss of something. It's a recognition of not having what could be possible. But the thing is, if we believe what we believe, that we are all reconciled to God, that that's the ultimate kind of image of of Christian community— the promises that God has made. What our sadness can turn into is a sense of empathy and understanding what could be and what is promised that we can use as a tool to find compassion. How do we find compassion. You know, it's interesting to me that, um, I'll go back, I'll jump back. When I w- was in Memphis some time ago, I, I worked with a wonderful deacon who, who taught me a lot. He uh, was really interested in agriculture, and so he ordered a, a Russian quince tree. I'm not sure this makes any sense to me, that had been grafted with another qu- quince tree so that it could could kind of bear the winters and also handle the heat. So I guess this is what you do if you're into botany, is you take the kind of attributes of, uh, of one thing and you graft them. You take what's not there and it becomes something drastically different. So he'd ordered a specially grafted quince tree from Russia that could handle the hardy winter and planted it in Cordova, Tennessee. I thought of David this morning. Um, we haven't heard it yet. One of the, the twists in, in doing morning prayer is we don't hear the collect for the day until the end. But the prayer that sums all these readings up says, may God graft 
into your heart the love of God. Through all this. So we as people, we have that. We have this unbelievable compassion and love that has been grafted into who we are as human beings. And so when I look out there in this world, and I, I am struggling to make sense of it. I'm watching violence that makes no sense to me. I mean, it, there is so much anger in this world. There are, we continue to watch violence that happens to people of color. We continue to see violence that happens on businesses as a response to that. We continue to see people that are fighting with each other because they, they believe that their way of this country, what their, their idea of power and, and politics is better than the other. And so we are seeing all of this anger and violence bubbling up. And what is the Christian response? The Christian is in response about who is right or wrong. Our Christian response is to listen with compassion. To try to understand why people are angry. What is causing that anger? Is it injustice? Is it fear? Is it anxiety? Is it worry that their life will be different? Or that their life will never be free? And when we break that barrier and hear what is underneath, we can be compassionate. God, can you imagine, like, if that's what St. Stephen's was known for? I think it kind of is, but a compassionate community. Like, do you need another tagline? I mean, that is church. That may not be why we're here individually. God, that says it all for what we can be in the world. A compassionate community. So know that your heart is being grafted with the love of God. It is being changed so that we can go forth and we can listen and we can discern where people are hurting so that we might be able to allow the love of God to break through. Amen.